Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined again by Dr. Edward Watts, the Vassiliadis Professor of Byzantine Greek History at UC San Diego, and today we're going to talk about his new book, The Eternal Decline and Fall of Rome, The History of a Dangerous Idea. So, Dr. Watts, welcome to the show again. Thank you, it's really fun to be here. I'm really glad we can do this. Okay, so, I, I mean, first of all, let me ask you, so this idea of the decline and fall of Rome, was there a specific point in history where people started theorizing about what might have been the causes behind it? Yeah, I think that this is a really interesting question, uh, and it's, it's a question that really prompted me to start with, start with the project that became this book. Um, because I, what you see in Roman history is, you know, from the very beginning of Roman literature as we have it, Romans are talking about the decline of their society. And to us, this is this seems really strange because the first evidence we have of this is around 200 BC. I mean, it's in the 190s BC that we have a playwright who's making fun of people saying these things. So already when Roman literature starts, the idea of Roman decline has become comical. Uh, but what happens is the state in the second century BC is still growing, it's still developing, and it's going to last for another almost 1700 years. So the Roman state is something that is in a way perpetually negotiating these questions of decline, even when it's not declining, when by every measure you can think of, its territory, its economy, its population, its sophistication, its technological development, all of these things are getting better, but they are still talking about decline. But there is another interesting shift because the Roman state ends with the conquest of Constantinople in 1453 AD. So again, almost 1700 years after they start talking about this, the state actually ends. Um, and what that prompts is a shift where instead of talking about decline with an idea about fixing Roman society, which is what Romans had been doing for those 1700 years, all of a sudden, decline becomes a cautionary tale that gives you an end point because Rome fell. Uh, and when Rome stops existing, uh, the fall of Rome becomes, in a sense, a tool that you can use to talk about any kind of contemporary development that troubles you. But overall, what we see across this entire span of time is the idea of decline is always connected to a kind of concern about change and a kind of change that makes people uncomfortable. And so in a lot of cases, decline represents not even a real negative shift in the way the society is functioning. It instead is a way that people capitalize upon unease to try to elevate their own political position and victimize or remove from political life people that they blame for causing the problem. Right. I mean, we're going to go back to that later on in the interview when we talk about uh, parallels to that in the modern world. But uh, I mean, was it that across history there were different claims, different ideas put forth by historians and perhaps other people, I don't know, uh, su uh, suggesting perhaps what would have been the causes behind the fall of Rome, and I mean, could it be that in different periods, different ideas were popular or not? Yeah, and this is exactly what's going on. Um, there's a, a great friend of mine who said that what you see in the modern world is a sense that the decline and fall of Rome can be used to explain anything that bothers you, right? So you don't like uh, pet policies in Florida, you can somehow find something in the decline and fall of the Roman Empire to say why these policies are bad. Um, but I think what you see across Roman history is there are themes that recur repeatedly in these discussions of Roman decline. So in the Roman Republic, um, when Rome is actually growing and developing and bringing more territory under its control, what people focus on is a kind of moral decline. So you, by any measure, you look at the Roman economy and it's growing. You look at the Roman military and it's, it's winning victories. You look at uh, material conditions in Rome and they're getting better for a lot of people. What you see is people focus not on those tangible conditions, but on what they say is a moral decline. 
Um, and so in the 180s BC, when Rome is growing really quickly, the uh, people who focus on decline are saying, well, yes, okay, we're doing well. But if you look at what is coming from these military victories, it's making us morally less strong, less robust, less, in a sense, traditionally Roman. And one of the things they center on is this really odd idea that uh, pedestal tables represent the moral decline of Rome. You know, tables should have four legs. And these <laughs> tables that are coming from the Greek world, they have one leg. And this obviously shows that we are becoming a decadent people because we're moving away from things that are functional and we're moving instead towards things that are decorative. Um, that's of course absurd on one level, but on another level, what they are doing is saying, look, things are different and they're changing really quickly. And this for a certain segment of the Roman population is disorienting to the point where they don't feel like they belong in the society anymore, or they don't know where they belong in the society anymore. And so what politicians realized is you can capitalize on this disorientation and you can give a way to explain what these people are feeling that allows them to understand in an acceptable fashion um, that society has changed and that there are implications for this that they are right to feel uncomfortable about. But what the cynical politicians of the 180s BC and, and every period afterwards are doing is in essence, they are claiming that they will fix the problem by targeting those people who have pedestal tables um, and who are embracing this new way of living that isn't traditionally Roman and that's making people uncomfortable. Uh, and the first person we see do this is actually the um, politician Cato the Elder, who uses this to get elected. Uh, and then when he is elected, he throws opponents out of the Senate. He imposes taxes that, that uh, disproportionately um, single out his political opponents, and he uses this unease to build a political brand that simultaneously accelerates his political career and undermines that of his political opponents. And this is a pattern we see throughout Roman history. Right. So before we get into the, uh, some of the dynamics you talk about in the book having to do with uh, conservatism, decline, renewal, progress, and so on, uh, about the actual fall of Rome. I mean, do we know what are the factors, the major factors that play the role there? I mean, I, I know that if you ask different historians, probably you would get a different answer from each one of them as with any other major historical event. But do we know specifically what played a role there? So I think there's a couple of answers to that question. I mean, the first answer is quite clearly Rome fell, right? I mean, this is a state that in the second century AD was probably, if it were a country now, would be the fourth largest country in the world. Um, it stretched from Scotland to Saudi Arabia. It stretched from Morocco to Russia. It's massive. Probably a quarter of the entire world's population lived under Roman control in that period. And it's not here anymore. So obviously it, it declined and fell. Uh, and we can't deny that. But what's interesting is across uh, Roman history, we have various moments where people say the state fell when it clearly still exists. Um, mm -hmm. So in the Justinianic period in the sixth century AD, we have the invention of the idea that Rome fell in 476 AD when the barbarian Odoacar overthrew the last Italian Roman emperor to reign in Italy. The interesting thing is in 476, no one recognized this. There's not a single person in Italy who said, yeah, that's the fall of Rome. Um, mm -hmm. Because to them, this is still a Roman state. It's still it's governed by Roman law. Um, it's still in every way is Roman. It just is a, a historical shift that 50 years later is going to become the fall of Rome. Uh, and it's used by Justinian to invade Italy to overthrow the regime in the West that still believes it's Roman. Um, Charlemagne does something similar to the regime in Constantinople in 800, where you still have a Roman Empire based in Constantinople, but Charlemagne's propagandists say, well, no, it fell because a, a woman took over as emperor, and therefore there's no emperor, so there's no empire, so there is no Roman state, so it fell, so we can recreate it in the West as the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, and so you have these moments across Roman history where people invent a fall of Rome to try to do something to that Roman state that still exists. 
But in 1453, the Roman state does end. Um, and when we look at that, uh, there are, I think, a few factors that we can see that lead to this. Um, the first is, you know, the, the massive victories by Arab invaders in the seventh century that takes the Roman state down from basically something that encompassed all of the central and western Mediterranean or eastern Mediterranean down to basically something that is kind of the size of modern Turkey plus the Bal some of the Balkans. Um, there's another major military defeat in the 11th century that not only causes the Roman state to lose a lot of Anatolia, but also prompts them to invite crusaders to come from the west to help reconquer this territory. And the crusading movement leads in 1204 to the sack of Constantinople, which really undermines the ability of the Roman state to function as a world power. Uh, and then you have a 250 year phase where Romans recover, but they never get back to the point where they were in 1204. Uh, and so the state ultimately collapses in part because of pressures coming from the east, uh, mainly from Turkic um, peoples, and then also pressures coming from the West, from people like um, Normans and Crusaders and Venetians and others who are, in a sense, both squeezing the state. And then in its final phase, you also have pressure from the North, with the Serbian kingdom in particular, exercising a lot of, um, being very aggressive and exercising a lot of um, activity that undermines its power. And so the Roman state does end. It does fall. No one can deny that. Um, it's, it's a self-evident thing. Um, but it's also important to understand that there are moments where uh, the fall of Rome is invented. Rome is still there. It's just people are saying it's gone. Uh, and so it's important as historians to recognize both of those things. So in your answer, you focused mostly on external factors, I think. But uh, were there any major internal factors, like, for example, political, economic, social factors that played an important role in the fall of Rome? I think that's, there definitely are. Um, there are very, I think we have to focus on both good decisions and bad decisions, though. I mean, one of the things that's so remarkable about the Roman state is it lasts for 2,200 years. Um, whatever the state was when it was created in 753 BC, it doesn't collapse until 1453 AD. And so it starts in, you know, basically the end of the Bronze Age, and it ends with cannons and gunpowder. Uh, and that's an incredibly long, um, resilient, uh, it's incredibly long time for a state to live, and it's an incredibly resilient state that's able to do it. But you do see moments where there are catastrophically bad internal decisions. Um, I think that the most significant one in the final phase of Roman history is there's a massive, uh, massively consequential civil war in the 14th century between, very, between two people trying to claim the Roman throne. And this is what in essence, makes it so that the Roman state is not able, it doesn't have the integrity um, to maintain itself anymore. Uh, and so there are moments like that where you see decisions made by people in Rome that are so consequential that the state, you know, loses ground, it will never get back. Um, there's another moment in the West in the fifth century where you see similar decisions made um, to, conf to fight a civil war instead of confronting barbarians who have crossed the frontier. And those barbarians never leave. Um, so there are moments where you can say, in essence, uh, the Roman state kind of commits suicide. You know, it, it, it doesn't kill itself, but it makes bad decisions that are so consequential um, that the state loses ground, it will never get back. Mm -hmm. uh, here, when we talk about the Roman state, are we referring to the Roman Empire, or is that something that started declining before the fall of uh, the Roman state itself? So I think we can, when we talk about Roman history, um, we, because it is such a long period of time, we have to talk about different phases in the operation of that state. So right. uh, it, the state, it seems, begins as a monarchy. Um, but not a hereditary monarchy, a kind of elected monarchy. Mm -hmm. uh, the monarchy falls around 509 BC and is replaced by the Republic. Um, the Republic starts out as a kind of aristocratic, um, aristocratic government that becomes 
more incorporate more inclusive um where it never gets to the point of being an actual democracy but it is a representative democracy that gets kind of more inclusive over time and the republic lasts for about 500 years uh, and then the first emperor augustus sets up the roman empire and the roman empire runs the territory of the roman state as a kind of unified monarchy where one person is in charge of everything for you know the, the better part of i guess you could say almost 400 years i mean there are moments where uh it becomes too complicated for one person to run it but there's still a kind of collaborative partnership until 395 when you have eastern and western roman courts that begin competing with each other uh and so the next phase in roman history is this this kind of eastern and western monarchy uh, that I think you could say definitively ends in the sixth century when Justinian unifies a lot of this territory of the Mediterranean again. And what we have then is what modern historians call the Byzantine Empire, which lasts until 1453. Mm -hmm. um, but the Byzantine Empire is in a way a kind of misnomer because all of the people living in this state call themselves Romans. They call their state Romania, you know, the Roman state. Um, they even call their language Romaica, the you know Roman language. Um, it is a Roman state, and so the Byzantine Empire is something that um, basically later people named this Eastern Roman state, uh, and we can maybe talk about why that happens. But um, but it was not what the state was called at the time. It was not what the people living in the state called their country, um, and so that's the last phase of the Roman state is you know, what we would call the Byzantine Empire that lasts until the 15th century. Mm -hmm. So before we get into more detail about the Byzantine Empire, let me just, just ask you about some aspects of Roman history that point toward this sort of dynamics we've been alluding to here. So in the book, you talk about, for example, renewal without decline. And I think that in that context, you talk about the Antonines and the Severans. So could you tell us about that and what were the sorts of ways they influenced politics in Rome? Yeah, so this is a really fascinating moment in Roman history because for a lot of Roman history, the story of Roman decline is always tied to this promise of fixing the problem that you've identified. Uh, and so decline is usually tied to some kind of destabilizing action that's going to lead to a transition. Um, where someone is going to either take power or they're going to at least remove the people from office who had caused what they identify as a problem before. But uh, in the year 96 AD, there's a dynastic change um, that brings to the front this dynasty called the Antonine Dynasty that is a dynasty based on adoption where the emperor will identify his heir and that person who is a, in some cases, like a, a remote family member, in some cases, not really a family member at all, that person will rise upon the death of the emperor to take over for that emperor. And what that means is these emperors, their whole legitimacy is tied <clears throat> to the success of the person who preceded them. So they can't do this traditional Roman thing of saying, well, I inherited all these problems and it was the fault of these people. And so these people now will be marginalized and I will fix the problem that I inherited because they did such a terrible job. These emperors can't do that. Um, and some of them do inherit very real problems. So for example, the emperor Hadrian takes power in 117 um, while Rome is in the process of losing a war in what's now Iraq uh, and in, in interacting with re, um, populations in the empire that are really, really unhappy about the conditions. Um, and the advisors Hadrian inherits are not good advisors. He doesn't trust them and he doesn't like them. But Hadrian understands that it would be natural in those conditions to say Trajan caused, his father Trajan caused these bad conditions. Um, but Hadrian can't do that. And so what Hadrian does instead is he says, there are problems and I'm going to fix them. But he doesn't blame anyone for causing the problems. He certainly doesn't blame Trajan for causing the problems. Because if Hadrian were to blame Trajan, Hadrian would not be a legitimate emperor. Uh, ha Hadrian instead makes Trajan a god uh, and then moves on and addresses the problems. And for the entire Antonine dynasty, this is the pattern. The emperors cannot target the people who came before them 
because their legitimacy is dependent on the success of the people that came before them. And so what the Antonine emperors do is they say, here are problems that I'm solving, but nobody caused them. Uh, instead, these are just things that happen, right? Cities get old and they need to be fixed. Um, barbarians get restive and they need to be dealt with. Uh, infrastructure de it declines and we need to fix it. But it's not anybody's fault. Sometimes things happen and we, as good emperors, we fix these problems. Uh, and so in the Antonine period, there is, a, there is a story of renewal and a story of decline, but it's not used to disenfranchise people. It's instead used to celebrate the achievement of fixing things that have gone wrong. Um, and it's an acknowledgement that things do go wrong for nobody's, you know, nobody caused them to go wrong. They just go wrong sometimes. Uh, and a, a functional state and a good emperor fixes them. Um, and so this is the shift that you get with the Antonines. Uh, and the Severans make the decision, the Severans are the next dynasty that takes over um, after the collapse of the Antonine dynasty. They make the decision to say, well, you know what, this actually worked really well. And so even though the Severans have no connection to the Antonines, they, they start using the names of the Antonines as their own. Um, they make up a story that they were adopted by one of the, that their dynastic founder was adopted by one of the Antonines. Um, and then he renames his son Antoninus. Uh, and this dynasty then continues this pattern of saying, well, things went badly and we fixed them uh, without identifying anybody for causing the problems. And so what the Antonine dynasty does is it creates about a century where Romans are focusing on fixing things and acknowledging problems, but not blaming people for causing them. Uh, and it's a very positive moment in Roman history um, because in essence, it allows society to come together to fix issues that they collectively confront, but it doesn't divide society in the way that this old rhetoric of there is a decline and you caused it, so you are not part of the solution, um, was doing. That, that's very interesting. Perhaps we will also come back to that when we talk about modern political events, but uh, then you also talk about uh, things like decline and false renewal. And I guess that one good example of that is what you mentioned about the third century. So what sorts of political turmoil happened there? Well, so I think what's interesting about the um, Antonine and Severan periods is this story of, well, nobody caused these problems. It kind of papers over the fact that, well, some people did cause some problems. Uh, and so the picture we have of the Antonine Age is, and one of our historians actually says this, um, the, the reign of Marcus Aurelius is Rome's golden age. Uh, but the reign of Marcus Aurelius was actually a terrible time to be alive. Um, the empire's hit with smallpox. It has maybe 10% of its population die, maybe as much as 20%. Um, there's all sorts of unrest, both in the empire and along its frontiers. La and the disease affects the empire so greatly that for one year, they can't even mount a campaign because the army is so badly affected. So there's real problems in the Antonine Age, really significant problems that get kind of papered over because you have this story of, well, we're just fixing problems and everything is good and you know continuity is great. And then you get to the third century and the empire again has really significant problems, but it also has a lack of imperial stability. And so between 235 and about 284, we have more people claiming to be emperors than there are years in that span. Uh, and so it is a time of tremendous political upheaval. And there are not dynasties that, that um, create stability. And so it is a time when things are bad in the empire. But the way that people talk about it amplifies the problems. Uh, and so this looks like a period of unremitting Roman decline. Uh, but really, there's only the decade of the 250s that are really, really bad. The rest of this 50-year period, you see the, the state is doing not well, but it's, it's, it's holding its own. It's doing okay. But the story we get, because emperors are overthrowing each other all the time, is this emperor caused a problem, I fixed it. The next person says, well, you caused the problem, and I fixed it. The next person says, well, no, you caused the problem, and I fixed it. And so we have 50 years of people saying, the previous emperor caused a problem and I needed to fix it. And so the narrative becomes one of endless decline because this is the way that new emperors taking power justify the act of killing their predecessor. 
Uh, and so the story that we get for the Einstein age is one that is, um, it is over and it is exaggerated in the way that it frames this as a positive time. And the story we get for the third century exaggerates how bad it was. Uh, and the, the true historical reality is the third century is not a very good time, especially the 250s. It's not a good time to live in the empire, but it's not as bad as our sources say. And the Antonine Age was a good time to be an emperor. All of them died in their beds. Um, you know, none of them were assassinated. That's great, but it's not a particularly good time to be a Roman, even though our sources say it's a golden age. And so I think what we have to see is the Antonine Age is a time of decline that doesn't look like it when our historians talk about it because they're focusing on continuity and, and nice renewals and positive things. The third century is a time of decline in our sources and it is a time when the empire is under really significant stress, but it's not as bad as our sources say because our sources get infected with the propaganda of decline uh, and the promise of renewal that never comes because the no dynasty is ever set up that lasts long enough that they can deliver on the promise that they were making. Mm -hmm. So in the later stages of Rome, uh, what sort of role did Christianity play? Uh, I mean, starting from the point where it became the official religion. Yeah, Christianity is a, a really dramatic change um, for, for the Roman state. Uh, because before this, um, the conversion of Constantine occurs in 312 AD. Um, and then Constantine takes about 15 years to take uh, full control of the empire. But by 324, he has done this. Um, and then you have a process across the fourth century of how then does a Christian emperor make Rome into a Christian state? And mm -hmm. Christians initially do not have an idea of what a Christian state even looks like. Because Christianity until the fourth century didn't focus on creating a Roman state. It focused on Christ returning. And so Christians right. didn't give any thought to the idea that, well, okay, we're going to take over the Roman Empire and we're going to make it a Christian state. And it's going to be a Christian state for a thousand years. They instead thought, well, you know, maybe, um, maybe there will be a Christian king and then, then Jesus will come back and that will be the end of it. Uh, and when Constantine converts to Christianity, they begin thinking about what it means to be a Christian state. Uh, and they come up with an idea that is a new idea in Roman history, an idea of creating something entirely different from what Rome had been before. Uh, and they come up with a narrative of progress that's very different from the story of Roman decline and renewal that Roman history had seen for the last at least 500 years. Uh, and so what Christians begin saying in the fourth century is we can make a better society than has ever existed before. And it will look like this, you know, it will not have um, pagan practices. It will not sponsor pagan religious activities. It will privilege Christianity. It will encourage people to become Christian. Uh, it will involve state support for the church. And if we do this, Rome will be better than it ever has been before. Uh, and so what you start getting in the fourth century is this story of progress. Um, and to us, that seems normal, right? We live, in a, we live in a world in the modern 21st century where we're always talking about our society getting better and progress is natural for how we think about how a society should work. It wasn't natural for Rome. And so this is an idea that uh, Christians are taking on that's really radical. Um, and by the end of the fourth century, they have gotten a Christian majority. They've instituted laws that uh, penalize paganism. They stopped the state support of pagan activities uh, and pagans start saying, you know, all of these things that you say are progress are actually decline. We're moving away from what has traditionally made our society strong and there's going to be consequences. We're going to start losing wars. We're going to stop having good harvests. Um, there's going to be natural disasters. You know, these are all things that we know from past experience happens when the gods are upset and Christians say, well, we're making society better. That's not going to happen. And then in 410 AD, the city of Rome is sacked by barbarians for the first time in 800 years. And pagans say, we told you so. And Christians need then to figure out what a Christian society is going to look like when uh, the promises of Rome being better are not actually being um, realized. And so you get Augustine's city of God and this idea that actually what Christian progress means is the individual 
is going to get better. And Roman society, whatever, you know, it can be there, it cannot be there, but the individual is what matters. Um, that fifth century reality is something that, again, is unique in Roman history, where people start saying, yes, I'm Roman, but being Roman doesn't matter. My state doesn't matter. It's about me as an individual and how I progress as a member of this community that can exist in the empire, but can also exist outside of the empire. Uh, and so Christianity has a very interesting effect on the way Romans talk about change and think about their society. Um, so, you know, so that's the beginning of it, but you have another thousand years where Rome is a Christian state, where the East does not have these problems. And so Eastern Roman Christians come around to this idea that Rome is a Christian state. And their story of decline becomes a story of moving away from Christian practices that had worked when Rome was strong. Uh, and so the Eastern Roman story of Christianity is one of Christianity and Rome are still completely linked in the way that, that Constantine's heirs wanted it to be. Um, and what they do is instead substitute the idea of being uh, Orthodox practicing Christians for this old Roman idea of, of corresponding and then practicing in ways that uphold traditional Roman behaviors. And so in the East, the story of Roman decline and renewal gets a kind of Christian um, twist where the decline is not a decline away from what made Rome great in its pagan period. It's instead a decline away from what made Rome a successful Christian state. Uh, and so they uh, adapt Christianity and the story of Roman decline to make their state a Christian Roman state with a kind of focus on the peak of Rome as a practicing Christian, Orthodox Christian state. So talking about the Byzantine Empire, what would you say are the major ways in which it is similar to the Western Roman Empire and what are the ones in which it differs the most? Yeah, I think what, um... So when we're thinking about the Byzantines, it's important to acknowledge that they see themselves completely as Romans. Mm -hmm. um, and so when they read histories, they read it in, I mean, these are now people, their language Roman, their Romaica is what we call Greek. Um, okay. But when they read histories of their past, they read Thucydides and Herodotus and the stories about the Greek past, but they also read Roman histories written in Greek that go all the way back to the foundation of the city. Um, and so some of the, the, the histories that we have that talk about earliest Roman history are actually written in Greek because in Constantinople, in what we now call the Byzantine Empire, this is their national history. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we have an almost unbroken string of narratives about Roman history in Greek, but we do not have that in Latin. Because in the West, this story of Rome is something that isn't a living story for a lot of these periods and for a lot of the people who would preserve these um, texts. So those texts don't get copied. So the historian Livy, who gives us a Latin history of Rome from the beginning until basically the reign of Augustus, does not survive intact. Um, but we have works in Greek that do survive intact that together give us the full scope of Roman history from the foundation of the city through 1453 AD. Um, and so when we're talking about these people, what's important to understand is they see themselves as Romans and they see Roman history as their history. But they are different from, say, people in the Antonine Age living in the city of Rome uh, in that they are also Christian. And so their history, their Roman history, is a history that also builds on a Judeo-Christian history that goes back to the events described in the Old Testament and scholars in the Byzantine period work very hard to create a kind of unified chronology that gives you the Old Testament, it gives you uh, mythology from the Greek world, it gives you Roman history in Italy, and it combines it all so you can figure out how all of these elements that make you who you are, right? your Christian history, your Greek history, your Roman history, all come together at a certain point and become a unified history. And so if you're living in Constantinople in say like the year 1000, um, your history is Greek history, your history is the Hebrew Bible, your history is um, the history of the Roman state in Italy, 
And your history is all of this coming together, starting with Constantine in the fourth century and giving you a kind of unified Roman, Greek, Christian history that adds up to who you are in the year 1000. Mm -hmm. So uh, probably this is not the best way of framing the question, but since when we talk about the fall of the Roman Empire, even nowadays, people tend to establish a parallel between that and what they call, I mean, this is sort of a narrative coming from some right-wing people, but when they talk about things like the fall of the West or something like that, is it's sort of the, that idea that we had this sort of major thing, major civilization, and uh, we are on the brink of its destruction, and then after that, it's going to be, it's going to come, I mean, it's going to be all sorts of bad things happening. And I mean, even after the fall of the Roman Empire, I imagine that in Europe, there were several people across different nations and so on, who, who looked back in history, and they looked at these massive uh, architecture and engineering and culture and so on, and they must have thought that maybe they have lost something great that was going around there. So, but I, I mean, looking more objectively at things, was it really the case that the fall of Rome and the Roman Empire was bad for Europe? I think it depends where you are. So if okay. you're in Britain, it is catastrophic. Um, and the Romans actually just leave Britain. It's not that they're forced out. It's that they decide that Britain is basically too expensive to maintain and kind of pointless for them to maintain. And so they just withdraw. But what you see about Roman Britain is after the Romans leave, the material um, sophistication and the economic sophistication in Britain drops below where it was before the Roman conquest. Britain collapses. And, and a big part of that is because the empire was in essence feeding resources to Britain. It was redirecting resources from richer parts of the empire to maintain a style of life in Britain that the local economy could not maintain. And so when the Romans leave, it collapses. Mm -hmm. um, and it takes a very long time for Britain to get back to the point where they, you know, they could do what the Romans could do. Um, so there's a, a poem that I, I reference in the book called The Ruin, where it, it, is, a, it is a British poem um, that talks about wandering through the ruins of what the Romans built. And the Romans are described as giants. Um, and the, the poet is imagining what this world would have looked like when they could build the things that no one around him can build. Um, you know, when they're tiled roofs. Well, you can't do tiled roofs in Britain because you don't have the materials or the climate, really. Uh, and so Britain, Roman Britain would have looked, you know, in some ways like Roman Italy. Um, but post-Roman Britain cannot look that way. They can't do any of the things that the Romans could do because they don't have the resources. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't have the skills to actually function in the way that their native economy functioned before the Romans came. Um, but then if you look at Italy, there is no real change. Actually, Italy probably is doing better after it loses uh, control of places like northern France and Britain. Um, because Italy is, until the Emperor Justinian invades and destroys a lot of you know, the infrastructure, Italy has a very sophisticated urban infrastructure. Um, it has very wealthy cities. And when Italy is shorn of the responsibility of paying for places like Britain, it thrives. Uh, and so I think when we're talking about what happens after the, the so-called fall of the Roman West, um, I mean, it's also important to understand that in Italy, nobody thinks they're not Roman anymore. Uh, in right. the, you know, the fourth, the fifth century or early sixth century. Um, and so we're, we're in a sense imposing an idea that Italy is not Roman anymore, that everyone in Italy would have thought is completely bizarre, you know, say, saying the equivalent of, well, you're not American anymore because the United States actually fell in 1992. <laughs> um, yeah. They wouldn't understand at all what you're talking about. But I think you also see um, interesting indications of the different changes that different parts of the Western Empire face um, in things like uh, a Spanish law code that's issued in the early sixth century. Uh, and this is a really fascinating document because it talks about, it uses Roman law from the fifth century, and then it offers interpretations that update Roman law to the conditions of the early sixth century. 
And there's a really fascinating law in there about public baths, uh, where the Roman law says that cities have to maintain property that belong to the city so that the city can afford to maintain baths and other public structures and also provide the wood for those structures. When it's updated in the sixth century under the, the Spanish Gothic kings, the law now says that the kings will provide resources if things break and there are no pub public baths anymore. Uh, and so what happened is the Roman law gave land to the individual cities and told them to do preventive maintenance um, and maintain baths for the public. The Spanish kings say, in essence, you, you don't have the resources to do preventive maintenance anymore. Cities no longer have property. Instead, I will fix things if they break. So we're not preventing problems. We're just kind of coming back in to fix them if there is a real problem. And all baths are now private. There is no public bath structure anymore. And so in Spain, what you see is the cities are still functional, but they are working under a different model than what you saw in the fifth century. And they're probably not working as well. They're probably more decrepit and the public services have definitely um, become less robust. And so I think that when we look at the West, we have to understand that there's catastrophic events in Britain. There's effectively probably no change or Italy has improved. And then in places like Spain, the change is somewhat marginal, uh, where a lot of what's going on in the Roman world, the legal system and other things is still there, but the state is kind of less robust and conditions maybe have deteriorated somewhat. Right. And what about, I mean, we've talked about the Byzantine Empire. What about the Holy Roman Empire? Does it have anything to do with Rome? or with the Roman Empire, because I hear from some people that it was neither holy, nor Roman, nor an empire. So what's going <laughs> on there? Yeah, so that's Voltaire's famous quote. And when Voltaire says it, I think he's probably 100% right. Um, the Holy Roman Empire is set up basically uh, through a collaboration between the Frankish King Charlemagne and, and the papacy. Uh, and the idea there is, again, this idea that uh, in around the year 800, the Byzantine Empire doesn't have an emperor because the Empress Irene has taken power for herself. Uh, and mm -hmm. Charlemagne is also very interested in launching an attack on Roman Byzantine territory in Italy. Uh, and so this the story of the crowning of Charlemagne as Roman emperor, it capitalizes on a perceived weakness uh, in Constantinople and its inability to defend some of the territory it holds in the, in the West. Um, and Charlemagne actually does launch a war against the Roman Empire in Constantinople, but he doesn't win the war. There's, there's just kind of a little bit of fighting. Um, the Venetians work alongside Constantinople and Charlemagne doesn't really get anywhere. And they end up making peace with the Empire in Constantinople. Uh, and the Empire in Constantinople remains the Roman Empire, and Charlemagne also continues to claim that he's a Roman emperor. And so that's the origin of the Holy Roman Empire. Um, what's interesting is as the Holy Roman Empire develops, it goes, it, it develops in such a way that it stops being a centralized state where one person is in charge and says, you know, this is going to happen in Silesia, this is going to happen in, you know, Northern Italy, and it happens. Uh, instead, what you get is a kind of decentralized, a decentralization of power. Um, and the emperors eventually come to be elected. The emperors eventually have to deal with um, kind of Game of Thrones style, a whole lot of uh, aristocrats who may or may not agree with what they're doing. Um, and eventually the, the conceit of the Holy Roman Empire is that the emperor and the papacy work together to promote the interests of Western Christianity. And as you get into the 16th century with um, the Reformation and Luther in particular, Luther begins saying, well, this is a total fabrication. You know, you, you basically stole the imperial title from Constantinople and you gave it to a German king. And that's great. You know, Germans are great. Luther likes Germans. But um, but really what needs to happen is we need to look seriously at what the papacy is getting out of this. And um, by the middle of the 16th century, the Holy Roman Empire uh, 
acknowledges that Lutheranism can be part of the imperial structure. And so it stops being this entity that is uh, the political wing of, in a sense, the uh, entity that the papacy controls the, the spiritual part of. Instead, it becomes a state that tolerates both Catholicism and Lutheranism. And this creates a kind of permanent tension between what the Holy Roman Empire was claiming to be and what it actually is. So, uh, I mean, apart from the decline of Rome, uh, I, I mean, do, do you think that uh, whenever people come up with these narratives of the decline of particular societies, do you think that it's always ill-intentioned? I mean, do you think that they always have ulterior political motives, for example? Um, I think that we can maybe say that there are three kinds of these stories. Um, one kind is what we talked about, where you're inventing something, right? There isn't actually, there's, people are uncomfortable with something, but there's not objectively a real sense that conditions are getting worse in this society. Um, but then there's, there's two other ways that these stories come up, and that's when there is a real problem. Um, mm -hmm. And so sometimes there's a real problem, and the society turns in on itself, and it starts fighting. Um, and so people, politicians, basically say, well, there's a real problem. So like in the United States, there's a real problem with wealth inequality and affordable housing and access to you know, the basic resources of life. Um, and what has happened in, in many cases is politicians have used this to get people angry about something. And then they've used that anger to elevate themselves and target other people. And it creates division in society that isn't really division about how to solve the problem. It's instead division that is about, I don't like these people and they, they are responsible for this problem. But there's another way to do this, too, which is there's a real problem and let's identify a solution and fix it. Uh, and so in that case, it becomes um, the society coming together to identify policies or actions um, or programs that they can undertake that fix a real problem that exists. And in those cases, decline and acknowledging decline is actually something that's positive uh, because you are, you are not only making society better, but you're bringing society together to try to collectively fix a problem that is real. And so when you actually make steps towards correcting that problem, everybody feels like they had something to do with it. And society becomes more cohesive um, and people become stronger. And in Roman history, you see all three of these. I mean, we, we've definitely focused on the story of you know, cre creating declines that don't really exist. But there's also real declines, obviously, real declines that the Roman state faces. And sure. in some cases, those declines are, are addressed very capably and they make the society stronger. In other cases, those declines are addressed very badly and they make the society weaker. Uh, you know, and again, I mean, that, that story about the 14th century civil war or that story about the 5th century AD, those are people responding to real problems, but they respond to those problems in a way that targets other Romans. Uh, and that made their society catastrophically weaker and led to really significant problems that the state never fully recovered from. So, uh, apart from th these more modern examples, are there any other historical examples of people coming up with this sort of decline narratives in other societies, civilizations? I think we see it quite commonly, but I think the Roman story is one that we think of first. Um, and, and I think a big part of that is, is that we're given. Um, who, you know, in, in the 1770s wrote a book called The Decline and Fall of the Roman yeah. Empire that he published sequentially. Uh, and Gibbon's work, I think, just because of the title, has cemented this idea that Rome declined and fell. And so people around the world know this. I mean, everyone probably, uh, almost everyone around the world knows one thing about Rome, and that's that it declined and fell. And they know it because this is the title of Gibbon's book. And it's a concept that is so enchanting. Um, but we do see this in other societies. And decline rhetoric appears all over the place. I mean, I, I know that lots of countries around the world do this. They talk about their society in that way. Um, and it, it can invoke Rome, or it can be just something that is a, a native way of talking about change. Um, but it's a very common thing to see. 
I, I think that Rome represents the most powerful example, certainly in Western Europe and the United States, of a society that um, everyone knows declined and fell. And so it becomes a point of reference that you can use when you're talking about what's happening in your own state. So do you think that when nowadays people in the West, particularly more so uh, right wing people, talk about the decline of the West, that this is mostly some sort of uh, narrative that has uh, specific political goals or that there could be something to it? I think that there are definitely political goals when this narrative is coming out. Um, but I think there are, again, are real problems in the West. Mm -hmm. I don't think that they are, well, and of course every country is different. I mean, the European mm -hmm. situation and the and the American situation are different, but, sure. uh, but I think there are overarching trends um, that are really discomforting to people. Um, I think that the, the economic situation in the past 40 years has gotten mm -hmm. much more unequal. Um, in a way that I think a lot of people find almost intolerable. And this is, this is a real problem. Um, and it's a problem that needs a solution. But I think we're struggling to find that solution. And instead, what we are finding is uh, individuals are targeting other members of society and blaming them for the problem rather than addressing the actual issue. Uh, and so I, is this a decline of the West? Well, I think the idea of a decline of the West is so abstract that you can find many different ways to talk about it. Um, the climate situation is something that I think you see on, on the left as something that is brought up frequently as something that is leading to a really um, remarkable decline in the ability of our societies to function. Um, I mean, in, in the United States right now, being in California, uh, we're seeing so many references to the drought that is collapsing the um, the system for supplying water to cities and farms. Uh, and this is a very clear, you know, it's a very clear change. It's a very clear negative change. The systems that we have had in place for the better part of a century are not working anymore. Um, we are in some ways seeing that infrastructure catastrophically um, challenged in a very catastrophic way and potentially declining and failing in a, a very catastrophic way. What do we do about that? And what does that represent? Does it make California uninhabitable? I mean, I, I hope not, but, um, but it may be in 50 years, we look at that and say, well, that was the story of our time. Um, that was actually a decline. You know, it, it made it so all of these states in the Western part of the United States could not sustain life anymore, uh, at least on the, the level and the population density that they had. And so it could be that there will be a story of decline that we are talking about right now um, that does actually stick as a historical narrative that people in the future will say, yeah, that was right. Um, and then what will we have done in response? And so I think that it's important to understand that decline can be real, but it can also be manufactured. And sometimes in uh, the fog of the present, you don't see where it's going. Um, we yeah. don't know that choices that we see as indicating progress actually were progressive. Um, and we don't know that things we see as decline actually will in 50 years or 100 years be seen that way. And so a lot of what we have to do is evaluate these claims and decide, is that claim real? You know, is this a claim someone's making to advance themselves? Or is there an actual problem here? And if it's an actual problem, are we coming together to fix it? Or are we just kind of acknowledging a problem and blaming other people so that we can gain a political advantage for ourselves? Um, and I think the real challenge when you're seeing these claims all over the place is what's real, what's not, and what is really consequential? Like what in 60 or 100 years is someone going to look at and say, yeah, you guys messed that up. <laughs> that was really something you should have all come together and fixed and you didn't. And now look what happened. You know, the population of Phoenix is half what it was because there's no water, for example. Um, and I think that's one of the challenges. You know, the Roman history gives us such a big picture and such a big canvas that we can see when those claims don't pan out. But 
we can't see that right now. Right. I, I mean, I also asked you that because it seems to me, unfortunately, that nowadays, whenever we hear, or it's, I mean, it's very common for us to hear the phrase decline of the West coming from people on the right who focus, I mean, I mean, instead of focusing on major things like economic inequality, climate change and so on, they focus sort of on culture war things like, for example, I don't know, women's rights, minority rights, uh, uh, Muslim immigrants, uh, LGBTQ plus rights and stuff like that. And I mean, so sometimes it seems to me that many people uh, on the right are making a political case for the decline of the West in the cultural realm. And I mean, sometimes it seems to me that some of the issues they bring to the table are really, really minor. Or on the other hand, I mean, for them, it seems something bad because they are political, politically conservative, but for the political politically progressive, these are good changes. So again, it also brings us back to that sort of dynamic between uh, sort of decline, renewal, and the, the tension between political progressives and conservatives. Yeah, I think um, what Rome shows is, Rome has those, has that discourse over and over and over again, because Rome starts out as an imperialist state, and mm -hmm. it gradually incorporates all of the people that were under its imperial control. Um, and so if you imagine yeah. like the British Empire eventually giving citizenship to everybody that was once part of the British Empire, and then you have prime ministers from India and Kenya and Australia, because now it's just one giant state. This is what Rome accomplishes. And it's something that um, in the big picture is an incredibly progressive step where all of these people, even people born as slaves, can become citizens, can become incorporated, can become full members of the society. Um, but in the, in the short term, when these changes are unfolding, it makes people uncomfortable. And there are people who demagogue this. Um, and so you have immigrant mm -hmm. roundups in the city of Rome in the 120s BC, and you have it again and again through the 90s BC, because people said there are too many Italian immigrants in Rome who are not Roman citizens, and they're taking our jobs, and they're taking our privileges. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you have them arrested and thrown out of the city, which seems like a very modern thing. But in 90 BC, or you know, by the early 80s BC, those people are Roman citizens. The people that were being rounded up and thrown out were Roman citizens, and they end up um, loyal Romans and the core of Roman identity as you get into the empire. Uh, and then under the empire, you have extensions of citizens to other populations, and initially there's discomfort. Um, there's this this very famous passage in Juvenal talking about the city of Rome and making fun of all of the immigrants who are there and the weird stuff that they do and the weird food and the weird gods and all of the things that, that have come into the city of Rome. And a hundred years later, these people are emperors. You have an emperor who is a priest of a Syrian god. Um, and so you have in Rome that kind of rhetoric of, you know, well, we're losing our culture. But Rome manages to survive and thrive in a way that, that draws upon all of the attributes of these people. And it's not comfortable for the Romans who are already Roman um, and already Roman citizens to see the extension of what they see as a particular privilege to people who don't have that privilege. But over time, the society develops and, and does fine from this. Um, and so I, I think what Rome shows is that is a process that is it can be politicized. It can be demagogued. Um, Roman history shows politicians doing that. Uh, and they do it a lot. There are a lot of Roman politicians that, that target these other groups of people living in the city of Rome, who in a generation or a century will be the core part of the state. Um, and so I think what Rome shows is that that level of concern, that sort of concern is something that we do see. Um, and, and we do see it tied to narratives of decline, but we also see that in the Roman context, these populations 
um, can be incorporated fully and ultimately can become leaders of the Roman state in a way that doesn't fundamentally make the state less strong. Um, but in the fifth century AD, we do have a failure of the Roman state to integrate people. Um, and there's a great book by Douglas Boyne that talks about Alaric, uh, the, the man who sacks Rome in 410. And he talks about that failure. Uh, and so I think that it's important to understand that sometimes societies can fail to do that right. Um, but again, in the moment, it's very hard to say whether we are in the fifth century or whether we're in the second century. Uh, it, you know, if that Roman story of the second century is where we are, our society becomes stronger because of its ability to bring in more people and provide spaces for them to lend their talents to the larger project of that society. Uh, and so I think what Rome shows is we have to be aware that a dynamic society does get stronger by being a dynamic society. Uh, and that process of incorporation is really key to what makes Rome so sustainably strong and why Rome lasts for 2200 years. You know, again, the people that Cato the Elder is saying undermine what Romanness is are Greeks, Greek intellectuals. He, he wants to expel them all. But when the state ends, those are the Romans. It's not Italians, mm -hmm. it's Greeks. And so the very people Cato wants to expel are the core of the state by its end. And I think that's an important thing for us to understand. Do you think that by studying the history of these ideas, like the idea of decline, that we can get a better understanding of why and when do populist right-wing and left-wing movements rise and perhaps also how to prevent that from happening? I think it can help. I think that there are conditions that we can look at in Roman history um, that show there are moments when you're more likely to have a demagogue uh, rise to the top of the political stack and, and become um, a really powerful figure. Uh, I think a lot of those moments we see in Roman history are moments that we can maybe identify with. And Roman history has demagogues of the right and of the left, um, especially in the Republic. You have people from both sides that come forward with radical ideas uh, and they're able to build a constituency because they have people who are uncomfortable with how the society is changing. Um, and so I think Roman history does show us that, for example, economic inequality and the rapid development of new structures that allocate power and uh, honor to people based on their ability to understand new dynamics, this is really profoundly destabilizing. Um, and, and that is something that really does produce demagogues, both on the right and on the left. Um, Rome sees both types. And when we see something like that in our world, um, we need to be aware that people really are uncomfortable about this. They don't understand the rules of their society anymore, and they don't understand how what they can do to function comfortably in a society that's changing so quickly. Um, and economics is a huge part of that. Uh, in Rome, the worst times are not the moments of famine and really significant deprivation. The worst times are actually moments of really rapid increase in wealth that is unequally distributed. Mm -hmm. That's the time when the state becomes most difficult to govern um, because it feels like the people who don't understand or don't benefit from that new economic reality are being left behind and they don't know what to do. They don't know what kind of actions they can take that will give them the place that they were used to having in the society that is changing rapidly around them. Um, and so I think that that's a moment that, that we, especially um, in the wealthier countries in the world that we're facing right now, um, where there is such a new way that the economy around the world is working and the pandemic has only amplified these challenges. Um, and, and that new way that the economy is working makes people uncomfortable because they don't know what rules are gonna govern their functioning in the society and, that, and their functioning in that economy. Um, and Roman history shows when that happens, 
it's very dangerous simply because people are looking for something that makes sense. Uh, and someone who is cynical can give you a story about why what is going on is being done to you by someone else. And mm -hmm. then it's very easy to target not policies that create these problems, but people. And once you start targeting yeah. people, you're not finding solutions. You're instead creating division just simply for the sake of creating division. Right. So just one last question. Do you think that there's an ethical aspect to the kinds of ideas you present in the book in the sense that, for example, uh, historians perhaps should be careful about the way they communicate uh, about historical societies and how they declined and fell and perhaps the sort of ideas that were permeating those societies throughout their longevity. I mean, because potentially those sorts of things could feed into these populist political movements. So do you think that historians should be careful about that? Yeah, I think we absolutely have a responsibility to be careful about that. And it's not just because of the populist movements. It's because our, our job, in a sense, is to try to figure out how to explain what's going on in the past. Um, and there are things that we intuitively bring to that that we need to be careful about. Um, part of why the book is is so long in its chronological scope um, is because I originally had hoped to write something that was smaller and something that gave kind of targeted examples of a few times in Roman history where people did X, Y, or Z. Uh, and what I realized is that would impose too much of my own views on a series of events that I think need to be told in their entirety so that people can make their own decisions. Um, people can see that across all of Roman history, here are the ideas that come out. Here are the consequences of those ideas. Here are people using similar ideas, but in a new context. And telling the entire story means I'm not picking the issues. Um, I'm not picking just a few incidents that particularly resonate with me. Now, I didn't, of course, say everything that could be said about this. That's impossible across this time span in, in even 50 books. But what I tried to do is to give a sense of how Roman history develops and how these ideas appear. Because I think as historians, it's not our job to tell people how to think. It's our job to give people evidence and give people materials so that they can think for themselves about these events. Um, and what I hope the book does, what I hope the book does, is it gives a full picture across all of Roman history about how these ideas were used by people so that when we're seeing changes in our society and we're seeing discussions of decline in our society, we can contextualize them better. We can get a sense for what might be going on. And we can try our best to understand if that decline is real or if that decline is imagined. And if the solutions proposed are going to make things better or if they're going to make things worse. Uh, and I think Rome gives us so many examples to think with that we can keep those in our minds, but we shouldn't take those examples and say, well, okay, what we're seeing right now when Joe Biden did this is Marcus Aurelius. And what we're seeing now um, when Bolsonaro does that is um, Hadrian. But we shouldn't think in that way. We should instead think, here are here's a big frame of reference for all of the kinds of things we might see in our world around us. And if we see something that's similar, we can think about its implications because we see the end of the story in Rome. You know, we see where that goes. In our world, we don't know the end of the story. We don't know if the decline is real. We don't know if the solution is a good one. But Rome might give us a way to evaluate it better. And that's, I think, what the job of a historian is. Um, is to just provide tools so that when people are making these claims, we can think about them and we can decide if, if it makes sense to us and we can decide if it looks like something that does require action. And Rome can help us with that. But of course, it's not the whole story either. Um, it just is a set of tools that can hopefully help us function in our society a little better with a little more evidence uh, than we can gather 
when we are living through the events that may end one way and they may end in a completely different fashion. Okay, great. So let's end on that note. The book is again, The Eternal Decline and Fall of Rome, The History of a Dangerous Idea. So apart from our first interview, where can people find you on the internet? Uh, so I, I have a uh, YouTube channel that is devoted to issues about Roman decline. Uh, there's a series of lectures that talk about the, particularly the period between the second and seventh century. And then also some materials that talk about themes from the book that are going to be posted starting probably next week. Um, so the channel is The Eternal Decline and Fall of Rome, and it, it should be easy to find. Um, and uh, otherwise, um, you know, I, I appear in other venues sometimes, and hopefully those show up too. Okay, so Dr. Watts, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show again. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. Hi, everybody. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. So to keep the channel sustainable and to keep it running, I would like to ask you to please pay a visit to my Patreon page. You have all sorts of benefits there and any amount, even just one dollar would already be a great help. You also have links to PayPal in the description box. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share the interview, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights Learning and Development Done Differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Kessel, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Enrique Lania, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Ruth Gervois, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, George Spinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Librand, Oslam Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roch, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostazewski, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Elman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidis, Saima Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, my producers, Cesar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Sergio Quadriano, Luis Caetano, Tom Van Agdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardus France, and Niruban Balachandran, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, and Matthew Lavender. Thank you for all.